Yo, what's going on, y'all? This is Anthony with The Movie Blog, and I'm back with another video. This time, we're diving into the latest episode of our favorite WTF show, From. This episode picks up with Jim receiving a long-distance phone call, Tabitha playing in yet another basement, and Henry finally getting on board the From Town crazy train as he's listening to Tabitha's story of children locked in towers and whatnot. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. From is at its best when it makes us question everything we knew about this show. Like, I think this episode is titled Mousetrap. Maybe. Look, I don't even know anymore because I've been burned twice already. I think this one is Mousetrap, and if it is, it makes sense as we finally find out whose foot that is that gets caught in a bear trap in the woods, which absolutely feels like a human-sized mousetrap. But first, before we get into the nitty-gritty of monster hunting, rotten veggie cravings, and the ghost kid throwing shade, do me a favor, smash that like button like your boy knocking out hope plus. And if you haven't already, hit subscribe, right? Don't make me send Cranky Ethan after you. Trust me, you don't want that smoke. Nah, nah, but for real, though, please just please like this video. I was told to get to 30,000 subscribers in order to get some more opportunities in this channel. All right, you ready? Let's dive in. All right, Frumley, we're jumping right back into the chaos like we never left. Thomas, aka the ghost kid with sass, comes in hot, talking mad smack like he's the town's roast master. Jim's losing it, and I don't blame him. Getting dragged by your dead kid, that's gotta stay. Now, we all know that Tabitha is not dead, but Jim doesn't know that. Real quick, I feel like this is one of those moments where the residents of the town are being taunted by the town with the explicit purpose of making them feel hopeless about their situation. It's been happening a lot more lately, and this is probably the most egregious of the situations in which we see it. What's even more is that this Thomas kind of echoes what happened with Jim at the end of season one when he was warned about Tabitha digging that hole. But this time, the voice on the other end is warning Jim about letting Ethan and Julie wander off by themselves so close to dark. We still don't know whose voice that was at the end of season one, but one thing is for certain is that that voice wasn't nearly as much of a dick as Thomas's. Jim drops the phone and heads out when we finally see Boyd ringing his bell to get the people inside before sundown. Now, this is usually something we see in the first episode, or at least we did in seasons one and two, but either way, it's welcome to have at least something familiar going on. Jim's out here running around like a dad who just lost his kids at Walmart, again. But for real, wasn't he Mr. Let's Work Together? Now he's tight-lipped about his haunted phone call? Like, yo, come on, Jim. Communication is key, man. It's key. Like, wasn't he the one talking about how people should be working together? That was Jim, right? I thought so. Anyway, his silly ass just walks off with his kids without saying a word. We then switch back to see Henry open mouth sleeping and waking up to see Tabitha breaking his dishes. Apparently, she hasn't slept a wink and has been up all night staring at the paintings. And I understand, I've been staring at these paintings all week. And you can watch as I go through them all in the live stream from last week. And you'll find the link in the description for that one because there's some major details in those pictures. Tabitha and Henry start talking about how the boy in white pushed Tabitha out of a window and she ended up home. Tabitha starts telling Henry how the children locked in a tower was actually a lighthouse and how Victor showed her a special faraway tree and slips that Miranda didn't make it. That's when Tabitha hears the bottles in the background and Henry tells her that Miranda set up a bottle tree in the backyard. <laughs> anyway, we switch over to see Victor back on his weirdo solo missions, this time with a shovel. Either he's looking for treasure or he's auditioning for a creepy kid's version of Indiana Jones. Victor's always got that energy like he knows something that we don't and I'm starting to think he might be right. It doesn't take him too long to find where he's looking for and he starts digging. We then switch to Boyd and Ellis talking about Boyd's kind of far out but legit intriguing plan to catch a monster. Boyd explains how he wants to use the talismans to try to box one in and see what might happen. Boyd starts giving one of his inspirational speeches and raising hope points with Ellis. 
Donald walks in and tells Boyd that Kenny, Dale, Christy, and Jade are going to head over to the second town to go get vegetables that they found that were growing last episode. They then share with Donna that Boyd's got this brilliant plan to catch a monster because, you know, Pokemon taught us that you gotta catch them all. But seriously, Donna's the voice of reason here, hitting him with, you need a better plan than this Pokemon Go strategy, Boyd. And honestly, she's not wrong. Donna then starts tap dancing with his nerves again when he tells her that he has concepts of a plan. And she's all like, work harder. Now, for everyone who may not know, one of the most annoying things you can say to Boyd and me is work harder, right? That's something that'll get me to go from zero to 100 real quick, real f***ing quick. Boyd exercises a hell of a lot of restraint and doesn't blow up on her like she's earned. Donna then calms down and says it calmly how he better think this through and not drag Ellis into this dumb shit. Wait, wasn't it getting dark? What just happened to that? Wasn't it getting dark? Hmm. Anyway, we then switch over to Clara over at Colony House cooking up some steaks. <gasps> the smell of it is disgusting the garbage picking Fatima and her demon baby. Speaking of the demon baby, just the idea of food sends her back outside to find the rest of the rotten vegetables to go get a snack. Listen, Fatima's out here munching on rotten veggies like it's a Gordon Ramsay nightmare special. Someone get her a Snickers or something, right? We're all worried about that demon baby. At this point, I wouldn't be surprised if it created moldy pizza next. Tilly catches Fatima's nasty ass eating garbage and Fatima runs off in shame when she gets caught eating, you know, mold. We then switch to Dale, Jade, Kenny, and Christy heading into the old town where they come across the scarecrows that are surrounding the town. Is it me or did these things move? Aren't they somewhere else? Like, I don't remember them being this close together the first time, but this could just be one of those production errors that some of y'all don't believe in. You know, like how when we see background actors with a red bandana repeating in a scene, Hey, let me stop, let me stop, before y'all have me eating my words. If y'all turn out to be right about that and the rock Victor put in the faraway tree, I will eat my words and apologize. Kenny takes charge and tells us the name of one of these new NPCs. Right, this other dude over here? He's called Roger, but the black girl hasn't had a speaking line yet, so she doesn't get named. We'll see what happens. Jade is the wise man in the group and comes to the same conclusion that we all have, that these scarecrows might have been used in the same way as the talismans in order to keep out threats. We then switch to Jim and Ethan fixing themselves some food and unfortunately Ethan is being tortured with Jim's home cooking. Did you see the look on his face when my guy Jim fixed him a plate? Thank god we don't have smell vision yet. Julie walks in and knows better than to try to eat that. Ethan starts getting creepy and morbid again when he asks who's going to bury Tabitha. Jim doesn't like that shit at all and starts getting pissed off with how Ethan starts talking about how his mom's body is somewhere rotting with spiders all over it and creepy shit and Jim throws a fit. Julie is still pretty pissed off and says some slick shit before walking off to go check on Ethan. And then the fucking phone rings again. Jim doesn't even answer this time. He just hangs it up. Whoa, wait. Are you still seriously watching this without subscribing? We've gotten pretty far. Come on. Hit that subscribe button like Jim hit the panic button when the phone rang. Don't be that person who gets left behind. Anyway, we then switch back to Henry showing Tabitha the bottle tree he has in his backyard, where we learn that Miranda was, you know, something of an artist and had installations like this set up all over town. Now, this is particularly interesting because this feels like confirmation that Miranda was the person who set up the bottle tree in from town that goes to the lighthouse. How many times did Miranda go to the lighthouse that she felt it important to flag it with a tree? And was that tree the same tree that Boyd saw in the woods with the notes in it back in season one? That was an interesting one because he actually took one of the bottles down and found a note inside with a year written on it. Tabitha realizes this isn't a faraway tree and Henry mentions that this isn't even the original bottle tree. He tells Tabitha that there's another one in a park a few towns over and how that was the place where they dropped acid together on his 35th birthday. Tabitha wants to go there immediately and they head off. We then switch back to Boyd who is in the church building something? When the ghost of Father Katri appears and starts talking to Boyd. He lets us all know that Boyd has been trapped in from town for a year and a half now. Wow. <laughs> Whoa. He starts talking to Boyd about his plan to trap a monster in a house and starts poking holes in his plan. 
and reminds him that the monsters wanted to break Boyd and how this plan of his is pretty selfish and stupid. He also low-key asks Boyd what it is that Boyd is building, and Boyd explains that he's building a memory board. And real quick, this is the first hint that this father, Katri, doesn't know what Boyd is thinking. Like, he knows the things that Boyd has said out loud, but he doesn't know what Boyd is building, and Boyd has to explain it to him. You may have seen my theory video where I theorized that this father, Katri, may not be a manifestation of Boyd's imagination and it may be one of those entities of the town instead. Hold that thought. We then switch to see Sarah sitting in her house trying to put together the toy that Kenny broke. Interestingly, it's her house again now that Reggie and his sister are gone. Rest in peace to the homies. Victor comes knocking at the door and comes carrying a package of whatever it is that he dug up. Victor asks Sarah for some sheets so that he can build a fort and go through his box of memories. Okay, real quick, if you're into this, go ahead, share this video with your fellow Frumley members, share the love like Victor sharing those side eyes of doom. Let's get everyone in on these theories before the monsters get them first. We then switch to Fatima trying to act like everything's okay when we hear a knock at the door, and it's Tilly. Tilly hit Fatima with this, oh yeah, pregnancy cravings are wild, and she gives her this line about licking eggshells. Girl, eggshells? That ain't a craving, that's a call for help. Somebody get these ladies a cookbook or a doctor, whichever one shows up first. You know what? Actually, ladies, <laughs> I'm sorry. This ain't my lane, but can y'all please tell me, is this a thing or better yet? This is a safe place. I want y'all to share all the weird food cravings that came up in your pregnancy so we can try to all get on the same page. Is Fatima's dumpster diving acceptable as a weird part of pregnancy, or is there really a demon baby in there with a taste for the filthier things in life? Tilly talks about how it lasted for three weeks and then just stopped mysteriously and says some comforting words to Fatima. Meanwhile, Fatima is breaking all the way down because, yeah, this stuff is weird and she feels completely alone. And yo, this Tilly actress is kind of doing her thing. Did y'all see how her whole mood switched up with Fatima when she tells her that she wasn't supposed to be able to conceive? Like all the air got sucked out of the room in that moment. It's subtle, but it's absolutely there. We then switch back to Tabitha and Henry heading out to see the bottle tree when we learn that Henry doesn't even lock the doors on his 1970s POS. As he starts his car, the music just starts playing on the radio all by itself and Henry lets her know that it does that sometimes. Just like the music in From Town. The song playing is Blue by Joni Mitchell. This song was released in 1971 in an album of the same name. Today, Blue is generally regarded by music critics as one of the greatest albums of all time, with Mitchell's songwriting and compositions being frequent areas of praise. Tabitha mentions that Blue is her and her husband's song too. Small World. Now, this is just another hint that there are generations of Kramenakles who have similar experiences in life. I know some people are going to theorize that Tabitha is the reincarnation of Miranda, but just do me a favor and hold that for a bit, okay? We just switch back to Dale, Jade, Roger, and the yet-to-be-named black woman all putting in work and getting all of their crops together to bring them back to town. They choose a hell of a spot to do their work as they're all bagging groceries right in front of the creepy scarecrows that surround this town. Jade's too busy drinking and scribbling to help. Dale then says something that makes sense when he gives Jade some shit for not really doing anything to fit in, and Jade mouths off at him and storms off. And this is when business begins to pick up, right? Jade goes off to relieve himself when he stands near yet another one of those really red rocks outside the village. He begins to notice another one too, and how they seem almost painted red. Jade then looks up at holy crap. We see what looks like a colonial looking dude with a nail going through his eye as he's nailed to a tree. And I can't help but immediately think of Kelly from season two who was in a similar situation where she was nailed to a tree, but still alive. Jade bravely walks up to dude and, you know, actually he must not have ever seen a horror movie before because who does this? Anyway, 
Jane walks up to the dude and we get our next jump scare in this series when this mofo reaches out and hems Jade up like he owes him money. Dale comes over to find Jade struggling with nobody and Jade has had enough. Now this goes back to my theory that these hallucinations aren't hallucinations. My guy Jade 100% was restrained against his will and you can see by his awkward position that he was standing in that he was struggling. I'm 100% of mind that Boyd, Tabitha, and Jade aren't hallucinating when they see Tom, Father Katri, or Nkui kids and are instead seeing manifestations of the good aspect of this town or the bad aspect of this town and they're all working against them or with them in sick and twisted ways. We then switch to Kenny who's gathering blueberries. Christy tries to console Kenny and says the cliche line, I can't begin to imagine what you're going through right now. I know this from experience that people say this when they don't know what to say. And I know y'all mean well, but sometimes this can be received the wrong way because it's so often heard by the person mourning. Kenny is in the latter boat when he just tells Christy to get her ass back to work. Jade comes marching through like Storm and Norman talking about how he's out this chick like a newborn baby. He wants to help, but he's not sticking around here no more. And this is when I knew. This is when I knew who it was that got caught in the bear trap from in the trailer, and it sure as hell was Christy. I told ya, I told ya Kenny was in the midst of his villain origin. Who the hell puts a bear trap in the more importantly, who put a bear trap in the snow? It never snowed here before. Who did that? Bear traps are usually put in snow, right? Do people bury them in the mud? Look, I, I know some of you in the audience, one of y'all must be a trapper, so I need help. Is it unheard of to just leave a bear trap in the forest and not bury it? Maybe it was there in the open and then it got snowed on. I don't know, but this whole thing is weird. We didn't switch back to Ethan and the new Mrs. Lou, Bakta. Real quick, I had a wonderful time speaking with Angela, aka Bakta, the other day, and I need y'all to keep an eye out for that interview. Most of the time, I want the interviews to be a surprise, but this one I'm giving y'all a heads up on that is coming. Anyway, Bakta is absolutely filling the shoes of Mrs. Lou in this scene as she starts making magic in the kitchen and keeping things in order. Bakta and Boyd have their first one-on-one -on -one moment together and talk about how crazy this effed up town is. Boyd says some inspiring words of hope to Bakta and once again raises the hope levels of this town. Ethan comes through being creepy again and starts talking all pessimistic, telling them that maybe they should all just give up. And I'm starting to really dislike Ethan. No disrespect to Simon Webster, the actor who plays him, but I'm going to need this little dude to cut this crap out. We switch back to Kenny realizing that the love of his life is in danger. Jade, Dale, and the others try to help when Jade realizes they need something strong to wedge her foot out of that bear trap. We then switch back to find Elgin finally taking a nap in Colony House. Tilly whips out some tarot cards and tries to convince Fatima that they'll help Fatima understand if her baby is okay. Fatima doesn't like this mess at all, like Tilly is just acting like this issue is a joke and goes off on her about the whole kooky baddie Tilly shtick and Tilly reminds her that they live in a nightmare that they can't leave and now Fatima wants to suspend belief in the unreal? She's got a weird sense of boundary, like this is where you draw the line when you got evil fairies that come out at night and eat you? Just <laughs> wow. Tilly talks about how those cards played a pretty big role in her life at a pretty critical junction and Real quick, is anyone else's spider sense tingling right now? Tarot cards? We've seen so much in this show already that relates to tarot cards. There's a really, really popular theory out there that you can find on Reddit where this guy, Tehran, goes in on how tarot cards relate to this show. In his theory, he talks about how this is a game between an accused witch and a balefuck demon recreating an event during the age of exploration. I won't get into his whole theory here, but he's given some pretty compelling details as to what is going on, including how we've seen lots of symbolism in this show that already mirrors the imagery of some tarot cards. I'll leave a link in the description. Tilly tries to use the cards and talks about how she got the cards from a woman named Gertie when her husband was in hospice care. We only really see one card when Tilly is shuffling and it looks like the Queen of Wands. This card represents an independent person who is confident, outgoing, and friendly, and who approaches love and relationships with a self-assuredness that is refreshing. 
Is this show telling us that Tilly is the Queen of Wands? I mean, it feels like they kind of let the camera clearly see her card, so it, it could be a clue. Fatima starts shuffling as Tilly shares that the cards were so helpful. We don't get to see any of Fatima's cards because the moment she tries to flip over a card, we get the shock of our lives when one of the ravens in the sky slams into the window the second that she tries to flip one and scares the hell out of us. It ends up flying into a wall and just dying over by Elgin who's sleeping on the couch while still wearing his raven shirt. We then switched back to Dale and Jade who are over by the Scarecrows and Jade wants to use one of the iron rods holding one of them up to pry Christy out of the bear trap. Dale warns him that he's got a bad feeling about this but Jade says it's their best shot at freeing Christy. The bad news is that they knock over one of the Scarecrows. Damn. And now I'm starting to wonder, what if the Scarecrows weren't there to keep bad things out? What if they were there because it was locking something in that circle? What if Jade just inadvertently freed the next threat in this town by taking apart the Scarecrow? Let's hold that thought because I know we'll get back to that. We switch back to Christy and Kenny with Christy ready to make the sacrifice play. And then Christy hits me and Kenny in the fields when she tells Kenny that she knows about Tian Chen's last words. And damn y'all. Damn it, Fool Han. Damn it. Jade and Dale come through with the poles and they're able to free Christy when Jade has yet another vision of the colonial man with the missing eye. And this time my guy is holding a skull in his hand and decides to drink some syrupy thick blood from the skull of a small person. And then holds that ish out like he's offering some to Jade. And this dude is giving me the creeps. What does this skull drinking mean? I know that some colonial societies, particularly those with indigenous or marginalized populations, engaged in occult practices that involved blood rituals. These might have been used for divination or healing or to invoke supernatural powers. While not common, some historical medical practices involved the consumption of blood or blood products, often with questionable or harmful results. Why would this dude be drinking blood? Ew. We then switched to Randall. Randall! Our guy Randall is here and he's carving what looks like a skull out of some wood. It's at this moment that we see Randall get another visit from the cicadas. And just when we thought this nightmare was over, we find out that it's actually still going. Boyd shows up at the right time with his hero powers to scare them away, but Randall pisses us all off again when he decides not to talk about what he just saw and experienced. And yo, this stuff is getting old. John, Jeff, stop this. I love you both for making this show as great as it is, but for real, stop it. Boyd lets Randall know that he's planning on sleeping in the bus tonight to watch the monsters. We then switch to Tabitha and Henry who are on their way to the bottle tree. Tabitha looks inside Henry's glove compartment and, and, and finds Jim's hospital bracelet. Tabitha asks him about it and Henry says that Miranda made it for him. Tabitha then has a full-on panic attack realizing the absurdity of her situation, explaining how she's seen that bracelet multiple times already. And now Tabitha is questioning whether or not she's really in Camden May. And whoa, <laughs> you know, for the most part, I've been under the belief that she's 100% in the real world. But this right here kind of throws everything in the question. Henry is beat fuddled by the whole thing and Tabitha threatens to get out of the car. Tabitha starts to break down with Henry trying to take them to the bottle tree with oh sugar honey iced tea they get hit by a car. What? What? They were right down the block. Damn it Tabitha. Damn it. You are not These writers are not doing you any favors in getting me to let you. Damn it. We then switch to see Henry and Tabitha in an ambulance. We see a couple of EMTs and the police officer Acosta who is with them. 
Henry is said to be having a little trouble, but they're keeping an eye on him when... God dang it! God dang it! They see a tree in the middle of the road and Tabitha freaks the F out. And... And credits. Oh, damn it. Freaking Tabitha, what, what, why? Damn it, y'all. This episode gave so much, but damn it, I am not happy with Tabitha right now. I really, really wanted to see Miranda's bottle tree to see if there was a faraway tree hole on the side of it. I, it wasn't just me, right? We all wanted to see that tree. And you know, it's important because the writers just stopped short of showing it to us. This mess is just getting out of hand. Jade is seeing dead people drinking blood from skulls. Fatima is getting attacked by ravens when her and Tilly are trying to find out what's going on with her baby. And Tabitha gets T-boned by a car when she tries to stop playing along and riding around with Henry. Was she really in Camden, May? Look, I don't even know anymore. But one of the things for certain, it looks like she's headed back to from town. Okay, uh, Catalina. I am so excited to speak with you. I've spoken with so many of the cast members. I think this is my first time speaking with you. I believe so, yeah. Um, don't worry. We're going to have a lot of fun, but I'm going to ask you some hard questions if you're ready. <laughs> oh, okay. Let's try me. Try me. First off, please, can you tell me, why is this show called From? That's not <laughs> it's a question for the creator. I still have a question, too. Um, a lot of uh, people saying theories about the name. I don't like theories. I want from the creator to tell me why they name from. I have no idea. I still have no idea. <laughs> okay, that's no problem. Well, let's go into your character, right? So after spending three seasons with Tabitha, I'm curious for you, how has she as a character influenced you personally, right? Are there parts of Tabitha's personality or her vulnerability that you've carried with you off screen um sure it's a little bit more fearless is is to stop being in fear all the time and i think right now where we live in 2024 i think there's a lot of fear from life from what's happening in the world that you can get consumed by fear and i think what happens to tabitha especially this season is that the fear like lowers down stops you know it's it's a healthy amount of fear that everyone should have and i think this is the season where she starts doing more just trying to get more answers trying to you know find find more um ways to leave town i think it's 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 a it's a more active season for her which i think is very interesting and like the other seasons season one she was terrified she was you know, she didn't believe that she was there. Season two is like, well, let's try to figure it out in my basement, still in a very safe space. Um, and now season three is like, whoa, she exploded. She's out. She's coming back and then just wait until to see what happens to her. <laughs> it's insane. So I think this season really actually exploded for her. That that was a great tease right there. Thank you for that. Um, well, Tabitha, she also has this uh, uh, grief over the loss of her son, Thomas, which is like a powerful undercurrent in her storyline. Yeah. Um, as a mother yourself, how do you how do you tap into these emotions? Does it like change how you approach scenes where Tabitha's maternal instincts come into play? I didn't think the, 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 I enjoy being a mom. I really do. I love being a mother. That's, I, I love hanging out with my kid. I love taking care of him. I love listening to him. I love, I love being a mom, basically. Um, and for me to play someone that had lost a child is something unimaginable. I don't know how she's still moving. Um, I have one kid, Tabitha has two more children, and I think that's her drive. You know, her drive is her other two kids. She cannot lose it completely or just, you know, not function because she has two more children. Um, but I just, in my personal life, I think that it has to be, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be myself. I wouldn't, how can you come back from that? It's impossible. You know, I'm, I'm with you on that. Well, 
out of this season, it seems pretty terrifying with a lot of the characters. What's been the most challenging part of portraying Tabitha this season for you? Is there like a particular scene or a moment that maybe pushed you outside of your comfort comfort zone, uh, emotionally or physically? No, I think there's a few. There's a few <laughs> that pushed me mentally. Um, uh, one, I don't know how many episodes have you watched. I've seen the first four. Um, I'm going to air this one after the third episode. So you can tease it if you can't specify. No, my mouth is not. I, I don't. I don't do tease. But I would just. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know what? There, there's a few. There's a few. Um, one around that time, I think season four. Oh, season um, episode four, and then at the, the 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 later episodes, episode eight or nine. I think that's when everything kind of like. I need to sit down with the creator and be like, "What's going on?" Like, you need to explain to me, like, it, I understand, I read the words, I understand what's happening, but I just need to understand what's happening inside of her. So, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, like, whoa, what's going on for me. Do any of these fears resonate with you on a personal level? And does that make the scenes harder to portray? Of course, I mean, like, one of my biggest fears is to lose my mind, to, you know, to, like, have one of those diseases that you just don't recognize who you are or you forget how to go to the bathroom or to walk and you need help. That's terrifying to me. To not take care of yourself and to depend on people and to not recognize those people. I think that's that's terrifying. And I think that's that's what Tabitha is kinda of like dealing with when she's in the outside world is like, am I going crazy? Cause is this real life? Is this not real life? Am I here am i alive like what is going on i think that's a little bit tease of like you know from what's happening in episode season one episode i don't know whatever when they're writing you know on the wall are are we dead are we like why are we here that's kind of like one question that is always in the back of her mind like why are we in this town that nobody there's monsters like what is this is this reality and I think that's again happening in season three where she's like, is this reality? Like, am I real here? Like, what the hell is going on? It's, it's, it, and that, that terrifies me, you know, to not know what is real and what's not and real. Well, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed yourself. This was a fun interview for me and I look forward to speaking with you again in the future. Thank you so much, Anthony. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. All right, family, look, we've cracked open another layer of this insanity. If you enjoyed this ride, smash that like button, like boy smashing hope points, and you better subscribe. Otherwise, next time, you might be the one stuck eating moldy vegetables with Fatima. Don't say I didn't warn you. And if you're interested, join me on our lives Monday at five. We're gonna talk about this in deep depth, deep dive detail all together. That's all I have for this one. I'm gonna check you all later. Peace.